And all this time, I thought the world was round. The world is not round. It has edges we can fall from and faces staring in entirely different directions. And I thought the world was huge, but it is not. It's in our hands. We can hold it, change it, turn it, shake it. We can solve it, but not by sheer luck or chance. We must be taught the way. Welcome to the world-class city. It has world-class towers of shimmering glass and steel. It has world-class expressways and soaring flyovers. It has world-class shopping malls layered like iced cake with floor after floor of world-class stores selling world-class brands at world-class prices. The world-class city has swanky airports that connect you to other world-class cities. It has world-class gated condominiums with world-class infrastructure. Swimming pools, manicured golf courses, air-conditioned private schools, tennis courts. Each world-class city is like every other world-class city. In each world-class city, you have traveled into the future. But there is one more thing about a world-class city. It has no slums. After all, slums are places of poverty, disease and waste. How can such a place be accommodated in the world-class city? A few years ago, in the city of Mumbai, India, global consulting firms and elite NGOs came together to craft a vision for the city's future. Mumbai, they said, could be the next Shanghai, a world center of finance, a dizzying frontier of real estate development, a showcase of iconic architecture, a sensorium of urban pleasures. If only Mumbai could get rid of its slums. And so the municipal government embarked on a spate of slum demolitions, rendering 300,000 slum dwellers homeless in a matter of weeks. Denounced widely, it came to be described as a tsunami. What happened in Mumbai was not unusual. In Indian cities from Delhi to Kolkata, the urban poor are being literally erased from the face of the city, Years of residence demolished in the blink of an eye. You see here satellite images of Pushta, a slum on the banks of the river Yamuna in Delhi. 30 years and 150,000 residents cleared for the Commonwealth Games which Delhi hosted. In the 19th century, Frederick Engels, Karl Marx's collaborator on the analysis of capitalism, documented the deplorable housing conditions of the working classes of industrial cities in England. Born into a wealthy family of industrialists, Engels argued that the bourgeoisie had no method for settling the housing question other than shifting it elsewhere. He wrote, The most scandalous alleys and lanes disappear to the accompaniment of lavish self-glorification by the bourgeoisie but they appear again at once somewhere else. The same economic necessity which produced them in the first place produces them in the next place also. Engels was prescient because 150 years later, the world-class city is still settling the housing question by moving its slums around. But here's the paradox. The world-class city is built by slums. Those flyovers and expressways, condominiums and office stars, airports and malls are all built by those who must reside in the place denigrated as the slum. They raise the children of the world-class city, cook its food, clean its villas and penthouses, launder its clothes. An irony isn't it that those being evicted as filth and nuisance, those being declared disposable, are in fact essential for the world-class city. An irony isn't it that they are the urban majority, well over half the population. The world-class city then is an impoverished frame for thinking about urban futures. To see the city from the slum gives us a different view. Slum dweller federations, for example, organized now on a global scale, propose that the slum is vital, not disposable, for the making of the global urban future. Against government efforts to render slums invisible, 
They self-enumerate, they map, they make themselves visible, they declare that they are here, in the city. And there is more. Take a slum like Dharavi. Reputed to be Asia's largest slum, it is a multi-million dollar hub of industrial activity, producing goods and commodities that are traded and consumed around the world. For the urban poor, Dharavi may be sheer survivalism, but for the global economy, industrial workhorses like Dharavi are essential. The story of the entrepreneurial slum is an important counterpoint to the dream image of the world-class city. Star architects who built iconic architecture in Shanghai but roam third world cities for creative inspiration, you know whom I mean, celebrate this culture of make-do and self-organization. Libertarian economists who roam the world as policy consultants, you know whom I mean, insist that the slum is not a problem, it is the solution. It is not a place of poverty, it is an economy of heroic entrepreneurs. To see the slum as entrepreneurial exposes the lie on which the idea of the world-class city rests, that the poor are disposable residents of the global urban future. Bullshit. Total bullshit. But it is not enough to think about the entrepreneurial slum. We must also pay attention to how the slum is a manifestation of profound inequalities, including those of urban policy. And the entrepreneurialism of the poor is not an antidote for these inequalities. Let me return to the Shanghai vacation of Mumbai. As the slum demolitions ravaged lives and livelihoods, the city's social justice activists asked a profound question. In Mumbai, 60% of the city's population lives in slums. Shouldn't they have a right over 60% of the land in Mumbai? What an audacious question. After all, slums are illegal. How can they lay claim to the city? But to see from the slum is to see illegality differently. Slums may be illegal, but so often is the urbanism of the affluent. From gated condominium enclaves to sprawling corporate campuses to leisure resorts, prosperous urbanization has also entailed illegalities, encroaching on protected wetlands, devouring agricultural land and violating municipal law. While the illegalities of the poor are criminalized, the illegalities of the rich are celebrated as examples of successful urban development. Thus, urban planning theorist Oren Yefthekel describes how the grey spaces of the powerful come to be whitened, while the grey spaces of the powerless come to be blackened or expelled from the city. To see from the slum is to view this totality. It is to assert the right to the city. Today, a powerful rallying call for urban social movements, the right to the city is a concept inspired by the work of French philosopher Henri Lefebvre. Writing amidst the tumultuous social struggles of the 1960s, Lefebvre argued that space was rapidly becoming commodified, bought and sold in property markets. The right to the city was the right to use space in the face of such commodification. The right to the city, Lefebvre stated, is not a visiting right. It is not the right to shelter or refuge. It is the right to urban life. I'm inspired by the right to the city, by its potential to disrupt long-established paradigms of urban order and planning. What are these age-old paradigms? Seen as a public health hazard in the late 19th century, the slums of New York and London became the muse of planners seeking to improve health, sanitation and living conditions. Concerned about the moral well-being of slum dwellers, reformers sought to also educate and civilize the urban poor. Documenting the tenements of New York through a set of extraordinary photographs, Jacob Rees thus insisted that reform by humane touch would not be about the delivery of coal and groceries, but rather would create bridges upon which men go over, not down, from the mansion to the tenement. Indeed, by the close of the 19th century, charity societies had proliferated in American cities. Friendly visitors, usually upper-class women, thronged the slums. As historian Michael Katz has noted of these rituals of voluntarism, 
They diagnosed the great problem of the day as the chasm that had opened between the social classes and proposed to close it through human contact. Sounds familiar, millennials? But the problem lay elsewhere. Jacob Rees himself had analyzed the New York tenement as an example of the greed of capital, one where powerful and unregulated landlords exploited the housing needs of the poor. After all, then, as now, there are massive profits to be reaped in the poverty business. But Jacob Rees titled his work, How the Other Half Lives, thereby marking the slum as other. Can this othering be disrupted? Let me suggest an allegory which may enable such disruption. I have a particular interest in the cinema of urban dystopia. You know, those films that depict extreme worlds of fragmented cities, segregated social life and environmental disaster. I'm drawn to them because in their exaggeration, they point to certain present day realities and at times even have a kernel of hope. One such film is Blade Runner. Now, I know that the young ones among you may not have seen this film. If you haven't, it is a film that depicts an urban world, LA 2019, sharply divided into the towers of corporate power and an underworld of survival and struggle. In the world of Blade Runner, replicants are the slave labor of the economy. Genetically engineered androids who have a lifespan of four years, they toil in off-world colonies and are banned from Earth. They are essential, but disposable. But their very existence calls into question humanness itself. The protagonist of the film, Deckard, played by, no, not Bono, but another white dude, Harrison Ford, is a Blade Runner, a guardian of order authorized to execute runaway replicants. But ultimately, he too must confront the question of whether he is human or simply a replicant. Philosopher Slavoj Žižek thus notes that Blade Runner forces us to confront a total loss of identity and to thus rethink what it means to be human. World-class urbanism relies on disposable androids whose labor produces the city but who are banned from it. What does it mean to see the city from their perspective? The city of Blade Runner is all around us today. In Mumbai, a single-family home soars 27 floors into the sky, a cantilevered sheet of steel and glass with helipads, airborne swimming pools and hanging gardens. The 600 servants, who must clean, staff and protect this tower, live in the dense slums beneath. Recently, a New York Times reporter interviewed a destitute woman who dwelt on the pavements of Mumbai near this $1 billion spectacle. She noted the vast gap between her life and that of this extreme wealth, but went on to say, I'm a human being, and the owner is also a human being. This is the assertion of a common humanity in the context of profound inequality. To see from the slum is to craft a politics of common humanity. To see the global urban future from the slum is to insist upon the right to urban life.